Hey fellas, I uh, want to give an introduction and a uh, little bit of an update on where I'm at with this machine. <clears throat> this is the SWTPC 6800. Uh, it was released or at least announced an order started being taken in uh, late 75. Um, it was sold to me by a 99 year old man who, this was his first computer. He built it himself, he ran an electronics shop, they helped other people build computers, and uh, you know, he was just really, uh, had a lot of interesting stories about, about how he used to help people with building computers and stuff. And uh, this machine, he bought it brand new, he originally used it with, uh, with a teletype, he had rented a teletype, and uh, it was originally just the base configuration, which includes this card back here, which is the MPC. It's a console serial device, also does current loop. And, uh, and the MPA, which is the main processor. The MPA, um, in its most basic form, if I can get this to... Maybe I should swing in here a little bit closer. There we go. So it's a real pain in the ass to pull these cards out, so... Uh, of course, this is the uh, 6800 CPU. This empty socket here used to contain a Motorola chip from the 6800 family that provides 128 bytes of memory. Yeah, I didn't say K or anything like that. That's 128 bytes of memory. Down there was the ROM monitor. The one that it came with originally was called Micbug or Micbug. Um, and this one currently has Swapbug installed, SWTBug, um, which is why this memory is missing, because Swapbug needs more RAM. <clears throat> Since I have Swapbug, I have to at least keep this board around. He's at A00 through AFFF. Uh, he's a SWTPC MPM board. Originally, these boards were available with 2K, with room to expand to 4K if you just bought some extra chips and you could do the upgrade for less than half the price of the original board and 2k kit um, there are two of these in here there was a limitation due to the amount of current that these guys pull and some other considerations because these are all uh, what are they like 21 at ones I think um, and uh, yeah they pull a lot of current <laughs> uh, so that's A00 through AFFF this is B00 through BFFF uh, up here in the front, this is a 32K gimmicks card. Uh, gimmicks made aftermarket cards for a lot of the stuff at the time. Um, this one is 32K, like I said, it's broken down into uh, four different banks. And, uh, and yeah, it's a, it's a pretty good solid card. It's, it's configured from 0000 to 7FFF. Um, the ROM appears elsewhere that it's escaping me at the moment because I don't have the uh, my notes in front of me at all. Um, so anyhow, that was the MPC card, the original console card for the machine. Um, if I can get in here close enough and get it to focus, you might notice right back here jumpers between 110 and 300 baud. This particular card would do current loop or RS-232 and had this very lovely Molex connector at the top for connecting your cables to. Um, this is what came after, which is the MPS. The MPS was a high-speed ACIA, and uh, you can see it right there. And it had jumpers built onto the board for jumpering it up as high as 1200 baud. Of course, the ACIA is, is uh, capable of doing far more than that. And so is the CPU. So there are modifications available to make it go. I think you can take it up as high as 9600. That seems reasonable. Um, I don't really see any reason to go that far because I, I like trying to keep a system in the way that it was used by its original owner. If 1200 was good enough for Jack, then, you know, I mean, this man was already in his uh, late 50s or 60s when he rebuilt this machine. Um, 1200 was good enough for him in the end, then that's what I'll keep it at, because this, this card is not modified. Anyhow, 
that's not where I'm at in the history of this machine because I'm trying to go through it in the order of its history so I can learn the way it was used. So the best that I could do was just a terminal on this card and then run these two cards together. But I needed to test all of the RAM. So I went ahead and installed all the RAM and uh, I just used a, a basic terminal um, with no storage capabilities whatsoever and uh, ran, ran the mem memory test on everything. I ran three separate memory tests. Uh, one of them just checks to make sure that all of the RAM locations actually would take a write and would respond back with what was given to them. They had different algorithms for what kind of data they were using to check, but other than that they were pretty much the same. And then there was one that was a very comprehensive test. You come in and write uh, like write an FF somewhere what, after writing 00, zero everywhere else and then it would go back so, so it writes 00, zero across everything and then it writes FF into one location then it goes and reads every other location that you've told it to, to look into and make sure that none of them say anything other than 00, zero. and then it goes and writes FF to everything and then it picks the next location to test and writes a 00, zero to it and then goes through and reads all the other locations and make sure that they still say FF <laughs> it takes way longer to do that on larger banks than smaller banks but I didn't have time to just sit here and wait like seven minutes for it to do a K so I set it up on this entire card and it took over three and a half hours to finish just on this card. Uh, on these guys with 8K, it took about 35 to 45 minutes per card. Or, I'm sorry, for the whole bunch of them. I tested both of these as one. So, so anyhow, this is uh, 00 through 7 FFF, uh, A00 through AFFF, and uh, B00 through BFFF. Um, and that is all the RAM that this machine ever had installed, 40 kilobytes. So, the tape interface was the next thing, because after Jack realized, hey, you know, um, it's great to play with this thing, but I can't save my programs. Well, he upgraded to a, uh, a paper tape punch capable um, teletype. He had been running a teletype. Um, but after a while, that became really boring to him because it was still 110, and he'd go over to a friend's house, and his friend had a CT1024, uh, glorious, you know, what was it, 32 characters on 16 lines, um, video terminal, uh, essentially a TV typewriter, and uh, he said, I have to have a terminal, so he got a CT1024. Unfortunately, I didn't get a CT1024. I sure wish that I had realized that he had had all this stuff because I would have bought more from him. Uh, but I was too late to get the 1024. So the next thing that he had was a Heathkit H9, which is a terrible, terrible terminal, but it worked for him uh, after he retired the, uh, the other. I've been using my Hazeltine 1500 because it's just a wonderful terminal. Um, let's see. So we talked about all that. The tape interface. Okay, so... I got it to where I was able to type programs in and run them, and uh, that worked real well. So I wanted to get the tape interface going. I have a big box of tapes for this guy. I need to do restoration on every single one of the tapes in the box, but I have no reason to believe that they will not be functional uh, once I splice the leaders back on and restore the, uh, uh, the foam for the uh, uh, backing the, the tape against the head. Um, this guy did not want to work on reads whenever I got him, so I had to poke around on him a little bit, and I found that the issue wasn't on this guy at all, wasn't on the cassette deck at all, it was a bad, a bad splice in the harness, or something was shorted, um, and uh, we had the 16x um, baud rate clock. Um, we had two things transmitting baud rate clock at the same time whenever this was in read mode. So everything came out gibberish. <laughs> Anyhow, so this tape interface is a Kansas City standard tape interface built by SWTPC. Uh, they had a delegate or, or two at that particular convention whenever they came up with this standard. Some of the things that were proposed was for the Kansas City standard interface to be able to um, 
control the tape media much the same way that uh, uh, you know you can control a paper tape puncher reader so uh, there there is an automatic mode that you can flip it into it has remote lines here that can pause and unpause the decks this particular setup is really brilliant um, there is uh, an A deck in and out and a B deck in and out individual switches so you can say that A is your record deck and B is your read deck um, and with full automatic control you could flip these guys up and uh, put them into the status mode and if this was on auto uh, the computer ran the show since I finally got all this working and I've told you a little bit about where we're at why am I turning that on first? I don't even have the terminal on yet. So I turn the terminal on. Yay! Power on. Slowly warming up. I'll go ahead and turn on the tape interface. And terminal is coming up to warm now. And so we'll get right on up in here. And I'm going to turn on the computer. Whoop. We have booted into its operating system. Yes, the monitor is the operating system for the machine itself. There is an operating system for disks, but this is the machine's operating system. This one is called Swatbug. So with Swatbug, you can do a lot of things like examine memory addresses, no toggling of switches. There it is. It's right there. You're just interfacing directly with it. So I'm showing you here that we have all FFs in the first 16 bytes of memory. What I'm going to do now is go into the same memory address and instead of inspecting it I'm going to put in the last byte of the memory address. Oh, I screwed that up, didn't I? Well, let uh, me tell you another secret. You can hit the caret key and you go backwards and so I'll start this over again with 00, zero, zero, one, zero two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, eight, eight, okay oops I screwed that one up so yeah, that's not how I should have done that but there we go with a zero F and so now I will go back and show you 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, 3, 0, 4, and so on. So I have these contents in memory. Also, if you had a teletype and you didn't want to waste ink, you could push uh, just about anything, like a backspace will take you to the next one. But if you hit enter, it stops and goes back to the prompt. Of course you can also hit the reset button on the computer and it goes back to the prompt. You haven't lost anything. You're just reset back to the prompt. Um, so yeah, so I showed that those memory addresses have that in memory now. So now I want to tell the monitor where my quote unquote program is or where my data is. And so that goes in the special addresses that start at A002, which is part of that scratch RAM. If you remember back Micbug used a lot less RAM, so you could get away with 128 bytes. Uh, A00 was where a lot of Micbug stuff got stored at, so that kind of carried over with uh, with Swatbug. Um, so A002 is the first byte of the first address for whatever you're working with, um, and then the following pair is the ending. So by default, that, that RAM card came up and said that we would have been going from 5050 up to 5002, which makes no sense. So we've changed it from 0000 to 000F, which is the data that we just put in up there with the addresses and data matching values. All right. Boring. So we've got... Tape deck is on, it is selected to record. We will turn on the record channel and set it to data. Uh, I will go ahead and set this guy up 
we let the carrier stabilize, I send the data, and I end the tape. And no more data is going through, and I stop this tape, set him off. We're going to rewind the tape back, I'm going to let you listen to what we just did. And that is the one that we're looking for. So, um, let's see. That's the one we're looking for right there. So I'll back it up just a little bit. And we will come back into read mode on the interface. I'm going to flip this switch, which we haven't touched yet. That's remote versus local. So now I have the computer off. The terminal is here, and it is in local echo mode because the uh, the host doesn't echo any characters back, so you have to be half duplex. Um, and now I'm going to play back that section of tape directly into the terminal. Stand by, i got to plug that, hit, that jack back in. I forgot to do that. Alright, so we're in local, we're in read, we're in play, we're in the right part of the tape, and the tape player decided to give up. There we go. There's your data. There's your end of tape marker. And that is the end of that transmission. Alright, found the spot on the tape. And we're still in the read status on. I'm going to turn this back to remote. I still haven't turned the computer on. So I still got this local echo over here, but the computer isn't on. As soon as I turn the computer on, we'll get that swap bug prompt back. And we'll investigate that memory. And it's all back to FFs. And that's what I would expect. So let's put that back the way it was before we powered off the computer. That's pretty easily accomplished. Once you've got everything set up right, you hit L to load and release the pause on the tape deck and fairly shortly we should start seeing the data come through on the interface there there it is and there's the end of tape marker as soon as the end of tape marker comes up this guy returns us back to the prompt um, so memory zero 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 there's our zero zero our one, our two, our three, our four, etc. Now I know that looks really slow to you. That is miles and miles faster of a user interface than clickety clickety click click clickety clickety click 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 click. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, but I got a lot more I need to do, do with this system. I've got some tapes that need to be a uh, uh, little bit uh, worked on. And I need to put the cover back on that uh, AC30. But other than that, working a treat. See ya!